then let us begin with a word of prayer, please. Heavenly Father, please, please, please help us to do your will. Help us to proclaim your message to those we encounter in this life. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's go to the Gospel of John. Second chapter. And we'll start with a 22nd verse. Before I do that, I want you to remember where we have been at this moment. Let's see, let's look at all the stories. Do -do 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 -do, wedding, Nicodemus. Ah, ah, yes. Last week, Nicodemus came to visit Jesus. Nicodemus was in the dark. Okay, sure, it happened at nighttime, probably. But his whole mental attitude was in the dark. He couldn't see the light. And that, we have to understand that most of what Jesus does is to be perceived on two levels. Okay, I've said this before. There's the earthly level, the simple, it was nighttime. And there's the spiritual level, meaning you're in darkness, spiritually and understanding-wise. So we, we perceive that when he came and Jesus said, you need to be born again, or born of the Spirit, was Nicodemus goes, how can I enter back into my mama's womb? He was on the earthly level, where Jesus was saying, you need to find the Spirit and let it rebirth you. Go ahead. Well, clearly, though, something uh, motivated Nicodemus because he showed up. He was motivated. Yeah. He wanted, he really, truly, I believe, a lot of people say Nicodemus was trying to fake Jesus out, but he wasn't. He was truly seeking the wisdom that Jesus was portraying. Remember, Jesus had been doing signs. That is, those activities are what we might call miracles, like a healing or something that attracted Nicodemus's attention. That's what they're for. They're for attracting attention. Then it's when you got there, the attention say, okay, forget that stuff. Now let's talk about the spirit. Okay, so what's going on today? Uh, we're done with Nicodemus, and Jesus is down in Jerusalem still, or in the Bethany area. Any questions so far now? Do you remember, do you remember where Bethany is located? No. So I'm going to show you that first of all. I'm going to hit here, and I'm going to bring this open. This is Jerusalem here, right there. Just off the edge of it, about a mile away, is a place called Bethphage. And about a mile from that is a place called Bethany. This is where Lazarus, Mary, and Martha lived. And so Jesus was visiting them when Nicodemus came to visit him. Okay? In Bethany of Judea. There is another Bethany. I don't want to scare you too much. Right across from Jericho, there's Bethany of Perea. And that's where John was centered with his baptism call. Okay? So there's two Bethanies. That's why they end up with either Bethany of Perea or Bethany of Judea. Any questions so far? So, Jesus is here in Bethany of Judea. And we'll go with the Gospel of John, chapter 2, 2, 3, Chapter 3, oops, starting with verse 22. And someone could go ahead and take care of 22 and 23, please. I got it. Thank you. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside and spent some time there with them and baptized. John was also baptizing at Anian near Salem. Because the water was abundant there and people kept coming and were being baptized. Thank you. Where are these places? So let's, well, let me, first of all, any thoughts or questions that you have related to what we just read? 
anything come to you that is of interest? Was there lots of people wanting baptized? A lot of, you're, I'm going to question your use of the word a lot. What is a lot of people? In some places it might be 10. Other places it might be 5,000. What is a lot? Were a lot of people being baptized? Maybe. They put themselves in a location where people would pass by and would be susceptible to being interrupted in their journey and listen to this Baptist preacher. I like Baptist preacher, that sounds good. You know, amen, brother. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so this is also, if this is fairly early in Jesus' ministry, um, when I think about the disciples baptizing people, clearly they had more knowledge than we might attribute to them at this point. Okay. So these disciples were doing some baptizing, apparently. And why would they be doing baptizing? Where would they be doing this baptizing? This is what we're going to... Hello, Marty. Welcome. We need her chair to be here. Uh, sure. Okay. Why don't you sign her in? She's signed in already. Okay. Come on in, girl. You got a chair for you right over here. Thank you. Over here, Marty. Thank you. There you go. Sit right here. Right here. Yep. Okay, so you're hoping people were coming by, and maybe a lot did. It wasn't a location where people would tend to come by, and I'm going to show you that in just a moment now. Let me give you a sense of that. Let's see if I can't expand this. Oh, yes. Click open. If you go up the Jordan River, we'll start down here. From the Dead Sea, you go up the Jordan River. All the way up the Jordan River. Woo! See, there's a lot of Jordan River there. You come to Bethany, and as you hit this area up here, we're going to switch over here, and we're coming up the Jordan River, Jordan River, Jordan River, till we get up way up here to Salim and Hinnon. That's on a road as you as you're going north to Galilee. It's in Judea, which I'll explain in a minute. You turn left, and you go through this valley, and you go up to a major city. Okay, and we'll talk about this later. That pathway a lot of people would be using. And there's water up in this area, springs that produce water, so there's plenty of water for it. So they're in that place where there are people passing by, and there's water to baptize. And that's where John is located. Okay? Any question? Okay. Roman Judea is different from Judea that we were used to. Originally, we think of Judea, it's basically from Jerusalem south. That's the old Judea. But in the time of Jesus, the Romans had reset all the borders, and they called this Judea. It goes all the way from the bottom of the Dead Sea, all the way up to Galilee, and the Sea of Galilee. That whole area here is considered Judea to the Romans. So when they hear John talks about Judea, this is the Judea he's talking about. Yes? Just as an aside, I was watching the National Geographic thing yesterday, and if it were today, if you would look at the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee, they are one-third less, they're actually lakes, and they are actually very concerned for water, because at least one-third, if you look at that map, yes. it's at the Dead Sea on the right. This is the Dead Sea here. Go right where that little pinnacle comes in. Down, right here? No, no, down, right but Oh, up, this area here, right, it's completely gone. Completely gone. Yeah. And then if you went, the same thing is true with the other body of water, and they're, they're, and they're very concerned because this, there, there was so many uh, light on those two bodies of fresh water were fishing over the centuries, and now there's hardly any. 
and they're also more desperate for water because there's a, of what's happened in that area. And so they're all, right now, they're going, okay, what are we going to do just for drinking water? They're almost at a point now where it's just devastating. Right. It's because of increasing population, uh, and both Israel and J Jordan are drawing water off for their populations. Yeah. And that's totally expected, but it's a limited resource. Yeah. Um, they have talked about the possibility of making the Dead Sea come back alive by building a pipeline down to the Red Sea or the Gulf of uh, Suez, the Gulf of Aqaba, uh, and bringing ocean water in to fill the area. Well, what they, what they found was, though, at so far, it's, it's not feasible from the standpoint of oh, yeah. financially. No, it's, it's definitely not yet. Yeah. Not for what they'd get out of it. If they could bring fresh water, they would do it. Yeah. So, Inan, as you start going up here, up the road area, it's right to about here. You see where this, this city here is called Shechem. Uh, they would take this pathway up here, and people would be coming up, they'd go over there. And so you have a lot of people traveling across east and west from there. And there's a lot of springs and water there. So that's where John is going to be located. Anybody else? Any question, thought, or comment, please? Okay. Then let me read what might be the story. Okay. Jesus, oh, by the way, it is the first week of May in the year 28. The first week of May in the year 28. We know that because Jesus was down south for Passover. We know when Passover was in that year, and this is the following week. It's after Passover. He was there at Passover, and Nicodemus came and talked to him. Now it's the following week. Okay. Was the first Passover the 27th? Uh, the, the Passover that year was in the late April. April. Late April. But they said this is a year later, right? No, this is a week later. Oh, a week so it's later. right after Passover. Well, right after, a week and a half after Passover. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Jesus, he has two disciples, that's all. His disciples, Philip and Nathaniel, they were the first two disciples. Where were they? Who were they listening to when they were disciples, before they became Jesus' disciples? John. John. They were disciples of John the Baptizer. You said they had special knowledge. They did. They knew John. They knew all about his kind of baptism. Okay, so they're very knowledgeable in this, and they've done this before, so we'll get to that in a little bit. I want you to realize you said it exactly right. They knew what was something about what was happening. And his family, which would maybe include, would include his mother, brothers and sisters to some extent. Okay? They stayed in Jerusalem for the Sabbath of April 30-31. That's when the Sabbath occurred right after Passover. So it'd be Friday night and Saturday day. That's Passover. That's the, the day of the Sabbath. Sabbath starts at dark on Friday and ends at dark on Saturday. That's Sabbath. Okay? So it's going to be Saturday night, Sunday morning. And then on the morning of Sunday, May 1st, they journeyed down into the Rift Valley passed through Jericho, and I'll show you this, traveled north up the way of the Jordan and were miles to the north when night fell Saturday, uh, Sunday night. So let's take a look at this. They're here in Bethany of Judea. They traveled down the Wadi Kelt. Now here's a, there's an inn there of sorts. You can either take the ancient road this way or take the Roman road this way. The Romans built nice roads. Which road are you going to take? The Roman road. The other one leaves you susceptible to being attacked by thieves and such. They passed New Jericho. It was new at the time. Not old Jericho. That was up here. The, the original one where Joshua did his thing. They passed through New Jericho, came over, crossed over the Jordan, got on this path, and started heading north. 
It's going to a place called Adam. Okay? And that's where they are. It takes a day to travel south from Jerusalem to Jericho. It takes about four to five hours downhill. And if you want to keep going, you know, you just keep traveling and settle somewhere for the night, camping out. Question, thought, comment yet? I'd be in trouble. I'd be looking for a... You always get in trouble. Well, yeah, but I'd be looking for a, for a day's in or a... Oh, yeah, you're going to have a little challenge with that. Yes. Okay, that would be a problem. Okay, so now they are traveling northward. The next day is Monday. After Sunday comes Monday. They continue to travel. They pass through a place called Adam. Now I'm going to show you where this is located. So that you understand. Here's Jerusalem. They travel down through Jericho. They're taking up this road here, beside the Jordan River, to Adam. That's where the road diverts to go into Shechem. And further north it diverts to go over to Megiddo. So they're coming up to Adam. It'll be a couple of days at least before they get there. Okay? Question? In the late morning, they continued north. Late Tuesday afternoon, see, they've been walking. No bus, no taxis, you walk. Okay? They arrive at a place called Inon, which means, it, it's literally the word means springs. So we have, there's lots of water there. It's near a town, a village, called Salim. Salim. It's only seven miles south of a place called Beth Shan. You've never heard about that before. I assume. And I, I, there are very good reasons why you should not have heard about it. Okay, Beth, let me show you where Beth Shan is located. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. This is the Sea of Galilee. If you come south of the Sea of Galilee, you come to the end of this big valley here, and you come to a huge city called Beth Shan. It is not little, it is big, and it's full of Gentiles, Greeks, Romans, let me your ear. Gentiles, okay? Jesus is never, has never visited, as far as we can tell. He never went to this town. Okay? It's a big deal. Okay? It sits right on the edge of one valley coming into the other valley. It sits up there on a the hillside looking down at them. And I'll show you what that looked like. This is a view of the city up on the hill. I hope it can be seen. Yes. The city is up here, Beth Shan. The Romans had also built this huge area down below, which included temples and military and civilian living quarters. This whole area, this is looking out of a tunnel looking north to Beth Shan. To get there, you have to hike up the hill this way to get to it. There's no reason for Jesus ever to visit this place. But since the Gentiles con controlled this place, you had to be aware of it. Okay, any question about it? This is Beth Shan. This is where the archaeological digs are going right now, up here. It is about May 3rd, May 4th? It'd be about the 3rd, yes. Okay, Monday, Tuesday the 3rd. You got it, nailed it on the head. Okay, it's on the border of Roman Judea. It's on the northern edge of it. Mary and her companions continued north on Wednesday the 4th back to Nazareth. They're going to divide now. They stop, and they're going to send Mary, brothers and sisters, whoever, to go with her back home. You can't stay away from home very long in these days. If you come back, there'll be nothing there. Okay? While well, Jesus and his disciples join another guy who was there named John the Baptizer. Okay. John was there. 
Jesus, with his disciples and family, came. Then he sent his family on, so it's just John, Philip, and Nathaniel. And maybe a few others. They join John, who is doing what he always does. Folks, you got a problem. You need to stop. You need to change your ways. You need to look forward to the coming kingdom and the Messiah who's going to be among us soon. Come and be baptized and change your ways. Die to your old life and be born to a new life. That's John. That's what he's talking about. And people are coming to be baptized. We don't know if it's a lot. <laughs> okay? And so Jesus joins John at this place of Salim. Any question? Other than, uh, it, we do see in Scripture other places where it says many people were coming to John. Yes, we do. And we have them, they would say, all the people of Judea came. Yeah. All the people of Jerusalem. Yeah. Be a little cautious with words like that. Many came. What is many? A dozen? Two dozen? Fifty? A thousand? We don't know. But you're right. Many. It's a nice general phrase. So they baptized them in the name of what? Just changing your way of life? Yes. It was, and John's baptism was, was a, a baptism with a couple of parts to it. One was give up your old way and prepare for the coming kingdom. Another way is as a protection. When you were baptized with John, it was like putting on armor to protect you in the coming battles with the forces of darkness. You would be part of the forces of light. And so there was this combination of things that he baptized for, but not like we baptize in the name of. It was be baptized and change. Become a follower of the true God and not part of the cult of Jerusalem or Samaria. Okay? Thank you. Anything else? Okay. John was already baptizing at Inan, at the place of the springs. There was plenty of running water, and many people passed the area, that we're sure of, which lay near a major road for the people of Galilee on their journeys to and from Jerusalem. For three days, Jesus proclaimed the coming kingdom of God, and his disciples baptized. While nearby, John proclaimed the kingdom, and he and his disciples baptized. Let's go back to the Gospel of John. Chapter 3, starting in verse 25. I'm going to read a small section of it, starting at 25. Now, a discussion about purification arose between John's disciples and a Jew. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, the one who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you testified, here he is baptizing. So in other words, Jesus is there, and Jesus is baptizing. Did you hear that? I said, Jesus is baptizing. It says here, To whom you testified, here he is baptizing, and all are going to him. Was Jesus baptizing? People. John was. John's disciples were. Jesus' disciples were. Was Jesus baptizing? He may have been just speaking and having his disciples do the uh, wet work. If we go to John chapter 4, and I'll read it from right up here. John chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making 
and baptizing more disciples than John, parentheses, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. So John tells us a little later that Jesus was not baptizing. He was doing what you suggested. He's proclaiming the coming kingdom. But he's not doing the baptism. Okay? So, we just have to be careful with words. Okay? I have a question. Yes, please. It, re it reminds me, it, my question comes out of my background with my cousins who we had great, who were of a different Christian faith. Uh huh. Would the baptism of John be disclaimed in, with, by Christ's disciples and that you had to be re baptized in Jesus? Because no. that to me is kind of a sticky little wicket. At the very beginning here, Jesus and John's baptisms was identical. Okay. It's only later after the death of Jesus that you have a problem. In fact, Paul encounters that problem later because he arrives in the city and says, they said, well, I was baptized into John. I was baptized into Jesus. I was baptized into Theophilus or whoever it was. And Jesus goes, and, and Paul says, excuse me? You just need to be baptized into Jesus. And they were re-baptized. Baptized into Jesus. Okay? So that should answer that part of the question. Yeah. Before Jesus' resurrection, all baptism was John's baptism. They were identical. Okay? After the resurrection, it was changed because of the revelation that was Jesus. Okay? Anybody else? Thought or comment? I have one. Sure. I, I had, I've always assumed that baptism, as was done by John, was preceded by some other form using water of baptism that maybe wasn't, you know, turn around and change your ways, but, but I do know they had ritual cleansing, for example, for the temple. Is this all related? I assume it is. Yes, but let me go back now and just remind us. Where did John come from? Where was he finding his ministry? Well, he was Jewish. Good, there's a start. Where was he raised? Near Jerusalem. By whom? Yeah, his father was... By his dad, yeah. who was a priest. Yeah. His mother, who was a very firm believer. They were being raised in the temple cult, is what I call it. Okay? He left that temple cult when he went away. And he wasn't satisfied with that. He went away and went where? The desert. The desert. The desert. But what group was in the desert? Oh, oh. oh. Come on, come on, yeah. Uh, the Essenes. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. He went down with the Essenes. Now, what were the Essenes known for? Baptism, for one thing. And the battle between the coming forces of the battle for the dark, forces of light and the forces of darkness. You'll see how that was part of what he believed. So they did baptism, but not for that same purpose. Their baptism was to wash clean. That's what, you didn't have to, you're not converting or being dyed or re-raised. It was just to wash you clean, physically clean. I guess where I was coming with this is then if you had these uh, historical things that had been done, baptism would not have been such a strange thing because it was more or less already in the culture. Okay, then let me press it just a little bit more. They didn't call it baptism, but if you wanted to go into the temple area, you had to bathe yourself in what was called a mikvah, that is a communal bath, a, a, a swimming pool. Okay? And you go into the swimming pool, you are cleansed, and you come out, and then you can dry off and you go to the temple. You cleansed your body. That's baptism as we let later look at it. Yes? That's what the Mormons do. Say again? In their temples, uh, the, the high temples, that when we toured, they, that's, they still do that. Who? The Mormons. Oh, the Mormons, okay. Okay, because that's one of the, when they physically enter the sanctuary area, there is a pool. Good. And it is big. And you, you can't just, yeah. And that's cool. part of their ritual of their... And this is where that came from. Yeah, and they way. have separate, my understanding is they have Male separate dressing rooms, you know, and... Oh, yeah. 
you change your clothes and after that and you're in white robes, robes or whatever. Yeah. And that's exactly, that comes from the Jewish entry into the temple area, yeah. bathe and clean. Uh, so that's the original then that goes down to uh, Essenes. John picked that up, but he had more meaning to it when he took it out to the public uh, for other reasons. Okay, anything else? Okay, this middle section is a, a problem that occurred, and I'm going to get to that now. Uh, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. But remember, Jesus didn't baptize, okay? John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. I'm going to stop there for a moment. Okay, please understand the writer John. He takes time to um, explain things more fully that most of the other gospel writers didn't bother trying to explain. And he sometimes takes stuff from 30 years later and he puts it back in there to help you understand what was going on. John may not have said these exact words, but the intent is, I'm not the Christ. I've told you that. I'm not the him. I'm not the messengers who come before him. I'm simply one out here announcing that they are here. They're coming. He said that. Okay? And so he's saying it again here. Any question? And then he goes, he must increase, but I must decrease. Now, that's hard for most teachers, isn't it? <laughs> what do you mean? Tell me. What, I'm not, the teacher here. Not, not just teachers. Not just teachers. Really? I, to me, it's hard for humanity. You don't give something up once you've gained it. <laughs> well, yeah, I have to agree with you there. Okay. You made her sound like the best man at a wedding. Correct. And that was that the intent that John wants you to understand. That he's not jealous of the bride, groom, the bridegroom, but that he is happy for him. And that's John. He's happy that Jesus is here. Okay? That he sees the... Well, I won't go into that right now. Okay, he who comes from above is above all. Oh, don't we love philosophers? Oh, God, come from above, is above. What is all this? This is John. This is the Gospel of John, which is why a lot of people don't really like it. It sounds very philosophical. He who comes from God has God's message. Okay? He who is from above is above all. That he who comes from God has God's message. Say that last part again. He who comes from God is... I didn't hear the last part. Is, is, um, the, he has God's message. Okay. He is from God. He has God's... He's above other teachers, to use that phrase, because he knows... God's message, God's will. He was with God. Remember John's Gospel starts, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Okay? So, here Jesus is above all other teachers. He who is of earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. Two layers. Earth, heaven. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard, and that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. 
He's talking about what's going to happen to Jesus. That is, John looking back saying, this is what happened. He came with a message of God's will, and people went... <clears throat> the, the religious bureaucracy went, forget it. Right? They refused to let John, Jesus, be the test one who testifies to the will of God. No, we, we would have immediately accepted him, wouldn't we? Because we, we are very open-minded, and we believe that if he's, someone says he's from God, we know he's from God, and we'll trust him, right? Well, I, have, I have no doubt I'd have been on the wrong side. Many times. <laughs> I would have been very doubtful. <laughs> and that's what we talked about. It's the human nature, okay? It's, I kind of have settled in what is true in my life, I don't really need to go through all this other stuff. I, I don't know that I want to hear all this other stuff. So the bureaucracy, of course, will not uh, accept it. And that's what John is saying. This is what happened. But probably John did not say that back then. Because he didn't see the future of Jesus' life. Uh, let's see. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. This is John looking back. This is the gospel writer of John looking back, putting into John the baptizer's mouth this explanation of Jesus' life. Okay? For he whom God has sent, Jesus, speaks the word of God, he has God's message, for he gives the Spirit without measure. In the Torah, it was, you get, if you fulfill the Torah, you are given, you receive the gift of salvation, or the blessings of God. But here, Jesus is going to say, you get the Spirit, and you get blessed by all of that. Not in relationship to what you gave, but because God is giving you a gift of blessing. So, this is a different thing to be said. John the baptizer could not have said this back then. He didn't know that much. But this is the Gospel writer John helping you to understand what was meant. Question? Thought? Or comment yet? The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. This we learned later. So again, John, the, the disciple John is reading it back into John the baptizer. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. We know that. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life but the wrath of God abides on him. Whew. I've got that underlined from somewhere. For some reason, at <laughs> some, some point, it tweaked your head. Okay, this is kind of like a big parenthesis in the story. Okay? Whereas, there were people coming to be baptized, and then all of a sudden this big explanation, and then th there's a problem that occurs, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Okay? It's going to be about purification. Let's see then. Let's get out of this and get on with the story. Did you say that he who believes in the Son or Jesus will be saved, but he that believes not will be something else? No, it can't be said quite that way. I mean, that's the way we understand it now. Okay? What it says here is that those who believe uh, will receive the Spirit and will receive blessings. Okay. okay, and then it says, but he who does not obey the Son, that is, attuned to his words, attuned to the Spirit, who don't receive the Spirit, will not receive eternal life. Okay, he says here, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not believe in the Son, will not see life. Will eternal life. Will not see eternal life. Receive eternal life. Right. 
That will be modified later with a better understanding, but that is most likely an understanding that the Gospel writer wanted to put here. I'll explain eternal life later. Okay. Not right now. It takes too long. Okay. All right, all right. let me give you a quick summary then, because I know that it's of interest now. What happens after the after the day of judgment, what happens to people? What happens to the sheep? What happens to the goats? Well, they'll be separated. They'll be separated. What will happen to those who follow the will of the Son? The sheep. Well, then they then they get to live in the in the presence of God. Correct. They go into the presence of God for eternity, right? What happens to the goats? They're kicked out. Where do they go? So I would presumably the, the lake of fire in hell. Thank you. Where they will eternally suffer, correct? Mm -hmm. Which of those two did not live eternally? All people have eternal life. We've learned that. Whether it's good or bad is the, well, is the issue. Whether you're going to be blessed or cursed. But all people will have eternal life. It's not what you're used to hearing. But that is a summation of the revelation, which is a whole different class. Okay? Any question or thought or comment on that that you'd like to make? That's disturbing. Thank you. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you'll take that other class on the revelation, uh, John and the revelation, I will help you understand that it's not as disturbing as you think. Okay, and help you understand what happens in that process. But that's a whole different thing, and I don't want to get into too much of that here. Okay, any other question on what is happening with John the Baptizer here and Jesus? I just wonder what, what version are you using? This one is the NASB, the, the new authorized. No, it's, it's, you know. This is the New Revised Standard Version is one I prefer. It, it translates things so much better and interprets them slightly. Okay. Well, Stand so she, she needs to understand, though, that this is not Scripture. That Scripture no. is when you pull up... Oh, no, no, no. Okay, thank you. If that's what you're pointing out. Not this. This is my understanding. This is an interpretation altogether. The Scripture is... When I bring this up, this is the Scripture. The other thing is simply trying to help you understand the scripture. Is that what you were referring to? Questioning? Well, I or do you, Oh, which translation do you have? The New International. The, the NIV, yes. Uh, that is a more flexible translation. They try to help you understand it a, more than a more specific translation. It's more like a version. Oh, I, I don't worry about the words. They're trying to help you understand it more than kind of use more words. They also have a different set of words that they use in NIV versus NRSV. Oh yes they do. That's okay. Go ahead. My only question that I have is, and I've asked it many times different places, do we have any way of knowing, it sounds like physically they were within you know, close proximity, did Christ and John ever have physical uh, uh, have a physical relationship where they actually knew each other, yes. talked to each other? Yes. No doubt. They are here near Inon baptizing together. The disciples are together. John and Jesus are both there. I'm sure they're talking to one another. They're both going out onto the, to talk to people as they pass by. This is a close ministry relationship. Okay. We also That's have right. a scriptural reference for it because John says, here's the Lamb of God. He's walking by. Okay. And that was much earlier. That was yeah. before the baptism. So, again, that was after the baptism. So, yes, a close relationship. Okay. And, of course, it could well have gone back to childhood. Mm -hmm. Okay? Anything else? It, hmm? it could they be, they, it might have been cousins. Cousins? Yes. They might have gotten together. They were certainly boys growing up together, according to the scripture. It would seem. Okay. So, let's go on with that now and find out what's happening. 
On Saturday, May 8th, it's the Sabbath again, Friday night through Saturday day. Okay? A debate arose between two different views on the issue of purification. This is a technical issue, okay? And there's going to be some disagreement. The Jews had long held that a person was pure only insofar as they kept the law of God, right? If you keep the law, you're pure. If you did not keep the law, you're impure. Simple. That understanding of the law. Is there any question about that? Well, just by that definition, no one can be pure. <laughs> Correct. But the Pharisees and Sadducees certainly thought they were. Yeah. Okay, and others. And the Essenes thought they were. In other words. What was it, the consequence of being impure? What was the what? Consequence. The consequences of impurity are is that you will not you will be cursed by God rather than blessed by God. That's the covenant agreement with Abraham and Moses and the whole bit. That is, if you do what God asks, you'll be blessed. If you don't, you'll be cursed. So you'll probably get sick. It's a cursing of God. You know, that's how they understood illness or accidents. Things like that are curses from God. Okay? Okay. The Jews, okay, then. if one should break the law, how is it that washing your body could wash away your guilt for violating God's law. The Jew could not understand that, these rich, these uh, bureaucrats. If I have broken the law, it's a, it's a curse from God. I have now violated it. I'm impure. What good does washing my hand do for that? It's just water. Different levels. The, the sin is inside. And washing outside can't possibly wash away that, can it? The guilt of having done it. And so the Jews and John's disciples were not, they couldn't see it. Because John's saying, you can wash away all that and become pure by being baptized. So they didn't agree. There was a problem. And this was what we're going to find out about now. John and his disciples were teaching that if a person was sorry for sinning and was prepared to change their way, repentance, that immersing oneself in water is a sign of the drowning of the old self, the old sinful life. And then rising from one's baptism, forgiven by God, I am I'm committed to dying to what I was, and I'm committed to being what you want me, God. Forgiven by God, one was born to a new moral life dedicated to preparing for the kingdom. Yes? The one word that I don't hear in that yet, yet. and it will come, <laughs> is that to me solidifies all that, because even at that point, I don't feel I am in my ability to understand, but it's the word grace. You don't know where grace fits into this. Yeah, because I believe that when you're baptized, it's through the grace of God that you receive that. Correct. And that's the word that I don't hear. You won't and hear it here, not yet. Yeah, no, right. Right. That's what I'm admitting okay. that. And that, and to me, that is that's what makes Christ's baptism different than John's in a sense, because through at least to this. Point, now in our day and age, at least, we are saved through grace. Right. And the baptism is We're a symbol of faith in the grace. Let me explain the grace in a general way. Okay. Okay. Did the Father send the Son for our salvation? That's grace. The fact that God, the Father, sent the Son, that's the grace. It's my gift to you is your salvation if you'll accept it in faith. That's the grace of God, the sending of the gift, the giving of that gift to you, to us. Okay? Just leave it at that. It's a nice, simple way of understanding at this moment. There are many details to be worked out. Okay? Any question then? Any further thoughts? Okay. Let's get back to this debate here. This debate.
debate, debate between the Jews and the disciples of, uh, that were baptizing people convinced both John and Jesus that it would be better to leave Enon and continue their ministries elsewhere. The Jews can get rather vociferous. Any, any group can. It's just in this case it's the Jewish people. The Jewish leaders, any leaders, will get a gathering to cause you problems if you're causing them trouble. Even our government will do that. Or conservatives or liberals or radicals. Everybody will try to convince you of their way. And if you can't convince you, they're going to try to push you out of the way. Sorry, that's human nature. John had been planning to go south to Bethany, Perea, anyway. That's his home base. He's planning on going back down there. So when they decide they should probably leave Enon, he says, I'm going home. I'm going back south. Okay? And so the next morning, Sunday, May 9th, John and Jesus begin their journey south. Jesus is walking with him, with his disciples. Any question? Okay, good. Because here it gets tough. Way to go, disciples. As they're traveling south together, some resentment arose between the disciples of John and the disciples of Jesus. Now they have an argument between them. Okay? For years now, John had been proclaiming this baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. He's been doing this for years. He's the master of this. This is what he did first. He's the teacher. Right? That's their thinking. Now, Jesus is proclaiming the same message, but because of his speaking ability and his ability to do signs, miracles, for example, more people had chosen to listen to Jesus and held him in higher esteem than John. In other words, they're saying, John is past, Jesus is the man now. And John's disciples don't like that. We know if that's very unusual among humans. We, <laughs> sorry. Then they held, okay. And John's disciples felt that was unjust. Right? Well, that makes perfect yep. sense. Yep. Okay, any questions on that so far? Okay, let's finish it then. When the company, that's all of them, John, Jesus, and all their disciples together, stopped for a rest, the disciples of John brought their egos, which had been bruised, to John. And they said, dude, you're number one. What are you happening with him? Get him, make Jesus toe the line. You're number one. He's only number two. That's what the disciples are saying. And they were surprised at John's response. John said that he only began the process and that it was his ministry to prepare the way for Jesus, the embodiment of Elijah. Everything is as it should be. John is coming to the realization not that Jesus is the Christ, but he now believes that Jesus is the must of the messenger, the Elijah's spirit returning to then announce the coming Christ or Messiah. Remember, there's the three tiers. There's the Messiah. There's Moses and Elijah who will come before him, and then there's John who's been saying they're coming. These two are coming. I want Elijah to come. That's why I pretend to be him. So now he's saying. Jesus is Elijah returned. What? Because he expected Jesus will now announce the Messiah. He didn't see Jesus as the Messiah yet. He saw Jesus as now, I think this is Elijah returned, which is what I've been after. And he will announce the Messiah. Well, later on, we know he'll ask the question. We know it comes later, but this yeah. is early. Mm -hmm. John is growing in his understanding. He didn't know who Jesus, what Jesus was. He knew Jesus was important. 
because he learned that at the baptism. Now he's getting to the understanding that Jesus may be the one who announces the Messiah. It's hard to think of your cousin as being the king of all kings, isn't it? <laughs> so he's not ready to go that far. He's saying, well, he'll announce the Messiah. Okay? I'm sorry it's confusing. Okay? But John says, this is as it should be. I'm not important anymore. He is. He's the one who's going to announce the Messiah. Okay? Jesus had become acutely aware that he would not accomplish the mission of the Messiah by doing what John was doing. The mission of the Messiah is completely different from what John is doing, announcing the Messiah and baptizing. He knew now, Jesus realized, he can't do John's thing and still be the Messiah. But he knows he's the Messiah now. He's, he's coming with that. So he said, I'm going to have to separate. I have to go do my thing, and John does his thing. Okay? That was not the ministry he was called to do. And when Jesus heard that there was envy among John's disciples, he's decided that it would be best to separate the two groups. So that evening, when they arrived near Adam, he informed John that he and his disciples would turn west in the morning and return to Galilee. They're coming south. Okay, they get to Adam, and John is going to come on back down to Perea, down to Bethany. Jesus is going to go back up to, Jer back up to Galilee. He's divided because now Jesus realizes he can't just do what John did. He's the Messiah. His ministry is completely different. He doesn't know the details of it yet, but he knows doing what John does ain't going to cut it. Any questions, thoughts, or comments? Yes, sir. I find it very uh, normal that John in himself would look at Jesus that way because they grew up together. Correct. Um, you know, everybody everybody like, knows that the, your sibling is yeah, not, I mean, no big deal. I played with you. I, you know, yeah. I, 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 I saw all your faults. Yeah, exactly. And all of a sudden, you know, it would be very difficult to switch that gear and rise him up to, you know, it makes, yeah. the way you phrased it there makes logical sense to me. I because all of a sudden he has to look at Jesus and go, wait a minute. This is the kid I grew up with that pulled pigtails and dipped him in the inkwell, so to speak. <laughs> you know? Yeah. This doesn't fit. Yeah, this doesn't fit. Right. It's, it's like a prophet is not without honor in his own home. Yeah. Okay. Are you saying that John did not recognize Jesus at that point as being the Messiah? Correct. Because he comes to that realization later. He grows. Well, he sends understand. people to ask Jesus flat out. Right. right? But, but, but that comes later when he's in prison. So John is realizing step by step more about this cousin of his. And, and I know that's hard to understand, but remember, this is not a one-time picture. This is a picture of a life. And things change. They change in your life over the years. They change in all of our lives. And we come to other understandings. Anything else? Yes. Jesus was baptized. I thought that the... John realized, he said, look, there's a Lamb of God. Correct. But that didn't mean Messiah, necessarily. He just knew that Jesus was someone who, whose life was now committed to God. He, he was very simple. He said, I'm not the Messiah. I am not Elijah. I'm one who's just kind of announcing that. And look, here's the guy I'm announcing. I'm out here in the wilderness announcing stuff. So pay attention. It's very difficult to understand this because it's a moving picture. Okay? And I apologize that it's not so simple. Anything else? Okay, next week, we're going to meet the woman at the well. Okay? Thank you very much. <laughs>